if you are new or haven't visited before, we're going through the book of John, and we go chapter by chapter, verse by verse, looking at the entire context of what God has to say to us. Because some of you may not have been here, and maybe some of you have memories like mine, and you forget what you had for breakfast already, where Jesus is at, he just finished having the Last Supper And he's got his disciples. He's downloading his most important things that he wants to communicate. And he uses this beautiful metaphor, abide in the vine. I'm the vine, you're the branches. And this whole idea is the vine, the main trunk of the tree with the roots that go deep into the soil is where we get our nutrients. And once we're connected into that, we naturally will bear fruit because we have the communication, the water, um, all these benefits that come through biting in the vine. And we camped out there for two weeks for a couple reasons. One, so many of us go through Christianity and we have this performance identity. If I just serve the Lord more, if I just muster up enough quiet time, if I just do this, then God will approve me. And that's not what it's all about. It's all about a relationship, giving yourself into relationship, making sure you're plugged into the vine, loving God first. And he says, if you do that, don't even worry about the rest of this stuff because what will happen is you will love God and you will love others and you will bear much fruit. Now, there's difficult things that happen. There's pruning, cutting away, Jesus identifying those areas of your life that need to be cut away. And we embrace those things because he wants more fruit. And he mentions this word love over and over and over for the first part of John chapter 15. But then he goes into the second half of John chapter 15 and he begins to contrast this ultimate loving relationship where true service naturally flows out with the world's reality and what to expect. Again, like last week he used love so many times, hate is used seven times in eight verses. What I believe Jesus wants to communicate to Feather Sound Church this morning is this idea of how to conquer hate and rejection. Why is this important? Every single one of you, us, we've dealt with hate and rejection. I mean, we've all been to high school, right? Or most of us. I mean, if you're homeschooled, I hope you didn't get a lot of hate and rejection, but um, junior high is terrible, man. Uh, We can be jerks, but we still deal with rejection. We still deal with hate. And I believe the principles we're going to discuss are applicable to a lot of areas in life. The context of a course is the religious leaders hating his disciples and the world hating his disciples because of who Jesus is. But we can apply these principles, I believe, to living our life out. And that's the practicality of the Bible and this message. In verse 18, he says of John chapter 15, that's where we left off. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. In other words, he's saying, look, you're in good company. The world will hate you. And it hated me first. I mean, look at Jesus' life from the time he was born. He's a helpless baby. And he is the king of the Jews, the king of Palestine, basically the Roman province, wanting to kill him. Herod found out through the wise men that there was prophetically a child that's going to be born in Bethlehem. So they're warned in a dream. They book it. They flee to Egypt. And Herod goes and kills all the children two years and under under, just to be sure that he gets this prophesied king. (laughs) You're like... I'm 11 pounds, and I have this king trying to kill me. I'm on the run for the first few years of my life. I I grow up. I've lived a perfect life. I've helped people. I have lived completely selflessly, even before we catch the ministry of Jesus. And his brothers mock him. They don't even believe that he is who he says he is. And I I don't blame them. Can you imagine? Why can't you be more like Jesus? Oh, man. (laughs) That must have been tough growing up with him as your brother. And so you... You see this, then the religious leaders who are supposed to, uh, who are supposed to know about the Messiah, they know all the prophecies, how he's coming, and and instead of embracing him, they reject him. In fact, they hate him, and they hate him so much they send him to a, a cross. The spiritual leaders wanted his head, and so Jesus tells us, hey, you're gonna, you're going to be hated. So the first question I have when I'm reading this, I, well, why do haters hate? It's insane. If you think about it, because if you look at the fruit of following God, 
what does it pr- now i want to contrast this world is full of hypocrites that's not just in christianity it's everywhere you go if i were an enemy i would try to take a look at these these christians who aren't really christians and make them look a lot like hypocrites don't Jesus is like, hey, I'm not taking credit for those people, (laughs) the hypocrisy they live in their life. We're not talking about self-righteous people who claim Christianity. We're talking about people who follow Jesus. You're you're going to be hated. But if you really follow Jesus, we're model, honest citizens. He roots out dysfunction out of our lives. And he changes people. I spoke about the New Orleans mission. And one of the greatest joys I've had is seeing addicts come out of literally the ditch strung out in the ditch living out of dumpsters and they give their life to jesus and there is this process of change that happens working with several guys right now amazing changes it's so exciting to me see what jesus if he gets a hold of a heart can do to people you know just speaking of drugs the earliest statistic i could find latest statistic i could find was 2007 so it's a little older but tells me that it's probably a bigger problem now but in 2007 the economic cost of drugs in the united states was 200 billion dollars you want to inject 200 billion more dollars into our economy just get people to start following christ and stop wasting the money in life with with drugs and things like that i read a secular study that said just by reuniting single family homes a father and a mother split up now there's two single homes trying to make it on their own if you could just unite those two people and how do you do that only by the grace of god and doing things god's way but if you could do that two-thirds of americans who are living in poverty two-thirds of us would be immediately brought out of poverty just by combining those two homes the economic cost of the structures of sin are astronomical that's just two areas following god is the best way to do it you know i look at christianity and in general um, they're more generous and interested in changing the world america yet way we call ourselves a christian nation the reality is we're just bearing the benefits of this judeo-christian ethic that's built into our morality that's rapidly waning but if you compare that to a group of people who have 30 or 40 years down the road faster than us europe secular europe where there's one or two percent typically evangelical christian we are on average seven times more generous than secular europe americans are the most generous and it has everything to do with our background and our understanding of who Jesus is. Do you know the church is the largest single provider of health care and education in the world, working especially in some of the poor countries where there's no other health care available? The Catholic Charities alone is 20% of, 26% of the world's health care. I, I read an in, a story about India, and I don't remember the exact statistic, but Christians represent Catholic and Protestant less around two percent of india's population yet is closer to 50 percent of the education and the and the health care in india isn't that astronomical it's astronomical the university system birthed out of the christian church the abolition of slavery civil rights movements the elevation of man made in god's image see outside of jesus most locations in the world life is exceedingly cheap I, years ago in the late 80s, I was in China and we're on the Huangpu River and we're in this boat and I'm a young guy and I look out and not really been confronted with death and I see a, a bloated body floating past the front of the boat, just floating there. And I was like, well, this is bad. Let's do something. And I brought one of the officers of the boat. I'm like, hey, and he's, he's just like, man, it's no big deal. We see it all the time. You know, there's like a billion of us. It's life is cheap in much of the world why because we don't identify and understand that we're all created in god's image and life is valuable whether it's in the womb or elsewhere life is valuable i have a friend who's a missionary in bolivia and they were living up in the incan villages the mountains of um of western bolivia and they found two babies in a dumpster in this incan village life is cheap so they adopted them brought them into their family why 
because they had compassion and they saw and identified that they're not just garbage, they're valuable. I worked in Nepal many times and we did healthcare and medical outreaches and uh, one of the, vil- in multiple villages, they, they, everything's made of brick. And so they have these brick factories and brick from the furnace has to be moved over here and has to be moved over there. And so what they do is they have indentured slavery. They have three to five-year-olds who carry the bricks. My little three-and-a-half-year-old would be working a full-time job if he was in this society carrying one brick at a time and stacking it there, making pennies a day because his parents couldn't afford something. That's the structures of this world outside of Jesus. I have a a friend that's working in a a village in India, and he gets all the babies that were abandoned or delivered at the hospital, mostly girls. They don't see value in them. And you know what this guy does? He raises them till they're four to six years of age, and he sells them to brothels. At four to six years of age, come on. What kind of person does that? And this guy attempts to rescue these kids out of this system. Orphan care, birthed out of our faith. I just bring that up. Because when we're confronted with Christianity, (laughs) in the Proverbs it says, when the righteous rule, the people rejoice. I bring that up then. Why does the world hate Christianity and Christians? Because that's the big question today. And I believe the answers are found here where we're at. Um, And the number one reason I think that it starts off with here in the PowerPoint, the points today, in verse 19, it says, if you belong to the world, it would love you as it is, as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. He tells us very specifically, the world hates you because you belong to a different kingdom. Or if you want to word it differently, you belong to a different tribe. In verse 19, he says, basically, you're no longer of the world, but you're in the world. You and I, as believers, if you've given your life to Jesus, you've been transferred out of this world and into a different world with different values. In other words, you received a different passport that says the kingdom of heaven on it. You are not an American citizen. You are of the kingdom of heaven. And there's two problems when people realize you belong to a different tribe or a different group of people or a cultural identity is that we tend to idolize our tribe and demonize other systems. What do I even mean by that? This is important you understand. Take a look at our politics. Last year, I was so ashamed of our country. The way we, you know why? Because I say that I'm liberal. I'm a Democrat. Or I say that I'm Republican. And what do I do? You're different than me. I demonize you. We shouldn't be bipolar on terms of who we are and what we believe in terms of our politics. Look, there is things that we should stand for, but the things that we fight for are ridiculous. You look at the current state of race relations in the United States. It's an embarrassment. Hundreds of years after this tragedy called slavery, and we're still dealing with some of this stuff because one group of people says, I'm so much better than that group of people because I have a different pigment in my skin. And see what happens, both black and white... We idolize who we are by our color and we demonize based on another color. We do that with our nationality. I've been embarrassed overseas as I've seen some Americans and people of the Western world, not in general. I'm not just picking on us as Americans. The reality is, is, hey, I'm so much better. I've been on mission trips where people are like, oh, these backwards people, why don't they do things? They've said that. I'm like, oh my goodness, you miss it. And we demonize people who are different kingdoms and different tribes. It's no different when you belong to the believing tribe and the unbelieving tribe. We're prone to it too. Oh, you're an unbeliever. Man, you're so, you got issues. We shouldn't be like that. But it's no wonder that people hate us is because our culture has a tendency, again, and I'll repeat it, to idolize your cultural group and demonize other systems. Second, he tells us right here, we're hated because of conviction of their own sin. First Peter 4 says, For you have, verse 3, you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. Hey, here's all the things you used to do. Now that you've become a believer, he says in verse 4, they are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless wild living and they heap abuse on you. 
It's the same reason people don't like to sin alone. Hey, I don't want to drink alone type of thing. Come on and join me. Because it makes people feel better about their, in their conscience, makes people feel better about their sin. I became a believer. I was backpacking through Asia and uh, got into some trouble, bad decision making in Bangkok. I gave my life to the Lord in Bangkok uh, of all places. I came back and I got baptized that summer. And instead of going to the college I was going to go, I went to a Christian college. Game changer for me. And part of the, ga- the, the college was that you had to sign a contract. It wasn't enforced. It was, hey, this is between you and the Lord. But here's a few things that we agree not to do. And you might say a little, a, little, a little legalistic, but one of the things was don't drink. I'm like, okay, that's no problem, even though I have a background of drinking and, and things like that. But I, I went, okay, I want to please the Lord, and if that pleases the Lord, I'll agree in that. I want to go to the school, and if that's what they standard they'll set, I'll agree to that. I go home at Christmas, and I'm with one of my best friend's dad, and he would, he would be at work, and I would often come over there. I had a great relationship with him, almost like a, another father, and, and we would sit there, and we would drink together. And, uh, and he loved to drink, so often he would drink in excess. And I got home and I, he said, hey, let's have a wine and ke- some wine and catch up. And I said, you know, I, I became a Christian and um, I agreed not to do this. And, and so I, this is important to me. And he heaped all kinds of abuse on me. He was doing what First Peter 4 said. He's like, oh, look, I don't want to do this on my own. And the reality is... Um, Nobody wants to sin alone. Um, The reality is actually nobody wants to be unmasked for who they are. That's one of the issues. John 3 verse 19, he says, This is the verdict that light has come into the world. People love darkness instead of light because their deeds are evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. For fear that they'll be unmasked for who they are deep down inside. This is, the message is all about identity all about identity, and we have to get to the core of that. And we'll talk about that in a little bit, because I believe John specifically speaks about that. So the two problems are, you belong to a different tribe, and people love the darkness. They hate it when the light exposes their darkness. I don't want to see the contrast with how you're living your life, if you're really living for the Lord. And in verse 20, he tells us something I think that's gracious. Remember the words I spoke to you, no servant is greater than his master. And if they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obey my teaching, they will obey yours. He's saying, look, you can guarantee they persecuted me. They will persecute you as well. What he's saying to us believer, he's saying, look, expect it. Expect it. It will happen. And sure enough, it sure did. The first century Roman historians, Seotonius and Tacitus, they record the fact that they had this hated group of people whom the mobs call Christians. We don't know why we hate you, but you're different than us. You're a different tribe. You don't worship the same pagan gods. You have one God. We have multiple gods. And you do these weird practices, and and you're different than us, and we hate you. Well, it's so interesting. Pliny, one of the governors of Bithynia, I think in modern-day Turkey, he wrote to the emperor and said, Hey, look, I know we're supposed to persecute these Christians, but can you clarify uh, by how we're, why we're supposed to do that, because they're really, mo- I'm using my own words, they're really moder- uh, model citizens. They take care of our, our weak, uh, at, and we don't. Uh, they look after orphans, and we don't. They kind of put us to shame, is really what he's saying. He goes, remind me why I'm supposed to, or how I'm supposed to persecute them. Um, <laughs> today's no different. Charles Markman, he wrote a a favorable book on the history of the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, very, very, very anti-God establishment. And it was entitled The Noblest Cry. And he says, if the otherwise admirably civilized pagans of Greece and their Roman successors had had the wit to laugh Judaism into desuetude, the world would have been spared the 2,000-year sickness of Christendom. Sickness. How in the world can you say that? How different would Western world look like? (laughs) If Jesus never walked this planet. But the reality is, he says, expect it. And we should face it. You, you see, and Christians are mocked everywhere. There's satires, satired everywhere across CNN and in the media. It just doesn't make sense. Except if you understand this. This was applicable to this group of people. 
I expect it. I'm warning you of it. Do you know that everyone in this audience hearing Jesus' words for themselves all died a martyr's death? Except for John. And history says, or tradition says, they tried to boil him in oil and he survived it. That's even a worse thing, I think, than being mur martyred. More Christians have been martyred in the last hundred years than all the 1900 years before that. A conservative estimate says there's 9,000 Christians a year martyred, killed because of just the fact that they're a Christian on average. And that's a conservative number. Depending on the year, some numbers are up to 100,000, depending on what's going on in what country. The reality is we live in a somewhat tolerant country because of our background. We're still bearing the benefits and the effects of living in a, a world that makes our moral decisions based on a Judeo-Christian ethic, based on the Bible. But that's changing. And he's more than hinting that, look, you will have trouble. You will have trouble. And he's more than hinting that if you don't have trouble, you might want to look at your lifestyle. Maybe you're not living a clear enough one. I don't know. That's something I need to ask myself. And I'm glad he tells us to expect it. it within our culture, there's this movement in Christianity which is a false move, and it's called the prosperity gospel. And the prosperity gospel comes in with all these great things, and they misquote stuff. Jesus says in John 10, and 10 he came to give you life and life abundant. And he wants to give, if you, and he pressed down, shaken together and overflowing. And, and we're all like, yes, because I'm selfish. And I go, that sounds great. That's what I want. I'm signing up. But the problem is, is that Jesus tells us, look, you, in this world, you will have trouble. And he tells us right here in verse 20, expect it. Things aren't always going to be rosy. And the prosperity gospel guys kind of leave that out to the side. No, Jesus wants you to drive a Mercedes Benz. And maybe he does. I don't know. But that's not the principle that Jesus wants to do in every person's life. In fact, it's quite the opposite in many cases. There's hardships and difficult times. And I'm glad he tells us because what happens a lot of times with people who embrace the prosperity gospel when the difficulties come, and they will, what do they do? I never, I never signed up for this. I'm done. I, I signed up for the stuff I get. I don't sign up for this trouble. And Jesus says, remember, they hate you because of me. So here's the central problem. Jesus tells us in verse 21, if I had come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty. Oh, verse 21, they will treat you this way because of my name for they do not know the one who sent me. The central problem is they don't know God. Five times previously in John, he declares that the spiritual leaders who were leading the people, here's you, you don't recognize me as the Messiah because you know why? You don't really know God. You've created a system based on works and tradition. Interestingly enough, just like every one of the world's systems, except for Christianity, it's based on relationship with God. It's a complete difference. You've created this and you cannot know me because you've created your own false system. And so here's the central problem. People hate because they don't know God. And so that brings the question up then. Well, then why don't they know God? Well, he answers it. Verse 22, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. Now, however, they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done among them what no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen these miracles and they have both hated me and my father. The reason they don't know God is that they rejected the words and the works of Jesus and they prefer their own righteousness. No, I'm going to do this. I'm going to earn my own salvation. I'm going to pick and choose who I believe in God is and what he is and how he operates instead of going back to the word of God and saying, okay, what do you say? Now, there's two types of unbelievers you can categorize everyone in these areas. One, those ignorant of the gospel and grace. The apostle Paul was one of these. Th these. He said, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief in 1 Timothy 1. Here's the people that are doing these things. Okay, I have good intentions, but I just am acting in ignorant because I don't know. And secondly, the kind in verse 22 that Jesus is speaking about. Those that have heard and hardened their hearts and rejected it. But the reality is, Romans 1 verse 20 says that man is without excuse because God's invisible attributes are clearly made known. This world is so amazing that at the end of the day, we're never going to be, say, gonna be able to say there is, a, there is no known causer of this effect. No. Yes, you might say everything was created like that. 
But what started a big bang or whatever you want to call it? There is a unmoved mover. Someone who brought it all into place, who spoke it into existence. Things didn't come out of nothing. And he's saying, look, you're without excuse because you can look around at creation. You can see all these things. And in Matthew 10, he says, the men of Nineveh, really bad dudes, will stand at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now one greater than Jonah is here. Jesus is here, and you're not believing his words and his works. In other words, the queen of the south, the queen of Sheba, in other words, will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and now one greater than Solomon is here. Queen of Sheba is going to stand, and she's going to say, Look, I heard rumors and I was weeks journey by camel away. And I heard rumors of the things that God was doing in the, work, in the world of Solomon. And I came to them and I made the pilgrimage to see if it was true. In other words, she was a seeker. And I'll stand here and condemn in, in condemnation for you who have access to the internet, to radio, and all these different as aspects of hearing the true gospel. Because you didn't lift a finger to explore it. The religious of the day had God in the flesh, his words and his works, and they did not believe, so their guilt is greater. I took uh, my boss's daughter, a good friend of mine, Nicole, years and years ago to the airport. I was going to the town and several hours journey. And I shared my story and how God changed my life. And halfway through, she's in tears. She's bawling. She's so impacted by how God can change lives. And it was interesting. I pulled over to the side of the road and I said, look, Nicole, What's preventing you from making the decision to follow Jesus, the one who changes lives today? Now, Nicole was smart. She had her act together. She had every advantage the world had to offer. And in tears, she said, I can't. Actually, what she meant was, I won't. She hardened her heart. The Holy Spirit was so active in her life, but she chose not to, weeping, and she still rejected it. Romans 10 verse 3 says, Ignoring the righteousness that comes from God and seeking instead to establish their own righteousness, they did not submit to God's righteousness. My friend Nicole, she wanted to establish her own righteousness. She didn't want to be submitted to God and to God's plan, despite the fact that God's plan is far better. They don't know God, <clears throat> they don't know God because they want to, want to live by their own rules. I was reading a couple days ago the famous philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre. He's very famous if you're into the philosophy world. And he influenced many people even still today. But he ended up with a philosophy called nihilism, nothingism. That, that really there's nothing. Nothing's really real. We don't know if we even really exist. I'd punch him in the face. Does that feel real? I don't know. Um, but here I found something interesting about his life. Is that when he was young... He explored this idea of God. He wanted to believe in God. But he was playing with matches. And he caught his mother's rug in the living room on fire. <clears throat> and he put it out. But the effects were there. And he tried to cover it up and hide the fact. And he said there was something inside of me that he felt God was speaking to. It was his conscience. And he was so upset that God would enter his brain as a child to try to influence him. That he says, I threw the Holy Spirit out of my life. The Holy Ghost, he said. I just, his way of describing. I threw God out of my life and I chose to reject him. Yet he pursued to pursue, he preferred to pursue this path of nihilism, nothingism. I don't know if I really exist. God never showed up. Yeah, God showed up and he built the conscience into you. But you choose to reject it and live by your own rules. And you don't like it when people live by other people, uh, God's rules. So the problems are, is they reject the words and works of Jesus and prefer their own righteousness. And secondly, speaking specifically of the religious elite, in verse 25, they reject, they don't know God because they reject the prophecy. See, the Old Testament is all about the Messiah, by the way. It's written throughout it. You can't go hardly a chapter without seeing Jesus through the Old Testament. <clears throat> In verse 25, but this is to fulfill what is written in their law. They hated me without reason. And he's quoting Psalm 69, verse 4. Jesus recognized it. And the beautiful part is Jesus goes, oh man, I'm facing with rejection because I recognize that's messianic. Interestingly enough, the religious leaders of the day had enough education. And they knew what was messianic, what was foretelling what the Messiah would be like. But they chose 
to go in a different direction. He's going to be a conquering political hero. And the irony of it is that they fulfilled this prophecy unwittingly, even though they knew the Old, Old Testament. They hated him without a cause. Jesus in fact, Psalm 69 says, They hated me. Those that hated me are more than the hairs on my head. We don't know what Jesus looked like, but he wasn't bald. He must have had a big head of hair because there was a lot of people who hated him. Um, I don't know. That's my conjecture. But here he is. The, he, he was a, a man of peace. He lived for others. He served them and they hated him without a cause. You know, sometimes we, there's reasons people hate us. A bunch of obnoxious, self-righteous so-and-so's. You know, we need to get that out of our lives. That's something that we need to, that Jesus doesn't want in our lives. But they're going to hate us even without a cause. In verse 26 and 27, when the counselor comes, whom I will send you from the Father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. And what he's saying is, in effect, there is a spiritual passing of the baton here. Jesus walked and lived and showed us with example. And he says, okay, I'm leaving. Now it's you. Plan A. No plan B. But I'm going to give you a witness. It's the paraclete. Remember from a couple weeks ago, John is the only one in the New Testament who uses the word paraclete for the Holy Spirit. And the word paraclete, it means the one who comes alongside to assist. He says, okay, expect it. Now that you know it's coming, I'm not going to leave you hanging. You're going to be hated. The way you handle it is, I'm going to send you someone alongside you to help you go through it. The paraclete. Four more verses. John chapter 16, verse 1. All this I have said to you so that you will not go astray. The word in your version might be fall away. Or if you have the King James Version, stumble. I say this so you won't stumble. The word is scandalos, scandalon. It's the spring in a trap. And what he's saying is, I don't want this to spring up on you and trap you. I'm preparing you so you don't fall away. See, a lot of people who aren't prepared for this would be like, this is Christianity? Man, this stinks. People are hating me. People are I've had people throw rocks at me in other countries. <laughs> Yeah. In Nepal, they call you a bunch of cow eaters. Hey, you cow eaters, get out of town. Because the cow is sacred and we eat burgers, I guess. But, uh, I mean, that's not the worst insult, I guess. But um, they, don't, they, don't, they don't expect it. So you don't fall, fall away. Wait, Jesus, what? What's happening? Well, I told you to expect it. Verse 2, they will put you out of the synagogue. In time, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he's offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I've told you this so that when the time comes, you will remember that I warned you. I did not tell you this at first because I was with you. This actually has already happened by the time G John penned Jesus' words. They were cast out of synagogue. Several disciples like Stephen were martyred by this time. Basically saying, you're going to lose social connections. People are going to kill you. People like Saul who think they're doing God a favor— why? Because they really don't know God. When I was with you, it was directed at me, but now I've passed the baton. You're my ambassadors. It's going to be directed at you, so be prepared. And so here is the crux of the matter. Here's where we finish. We're done here in John chapter 15, but how do you conquer hate and, re and rejection? The first question I want to ask is, why is rejection and hate so particularly devastating? And I say, it's devastating because it hits at the core of our identity, of who we are. So you're in junior high, and someone says something particularly offensive to you. They reject you. The girl rejected you. The guy rejected you. Friends rejected you. It's devastating. It's devastating as an adult. You get fired because it goes down to your identity. And this is what I want us to leave with today is in particular an understanding of our identity. And most graciously, I believe the Lord gave me the answer of what a biblical response to hate is. If you go to 1 John, same author. If you go to the right, keep going. You're going to hit P Hebrews and Peter. Uh, keep going. If you hit Revelation, go back. And you're going to find the book of 1 John chapter 3. Sounds very, 1 John sounds a lot like the book of John. Same author, the same kind of ideas. 
But the answer, how do you conquer hate and rejection, I find are really find, found in the first three verses here. In the first verse, it says, of John chap, 1 John chapter 3, it says, How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. Actually, that's not probably how it was written. John, often old, old, these people are writing with an amanuensis, a scribe, and they'd be speaking it. And I could just imagine John, he just finishes going, okay, in the end of chapter 2, he tells us about that everyone who does his right has been born of him. And then all of a sudden he realizes, my goodness, we're children of God. And he goes, how great is the love of the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. I don't know, but I know that there is a deserved exclamation point right there. He is overwhelmed with this idea. Okay, the Father's love is so great that we should be called children of God. My friends, love was so great that they saw compassion on two children in a garbage dump. And they took them home. It, there's one thing if your buddy, it, you know, hey, I need to have a meal tonight and you invite them over for dinner or maybe someone needs a room for a month and you invite them into your home for a month. That's loving. But then to go and say, you know what, I'll tell you what, I'm going to adopt you into my home. I'm going to bring you into my home. Now it's great that we should be called children of God. He's sitting back there going, I really need this to sink in. How amazing it is that while I was an enemy with Christ, he died for me. But not only that, he then takes the extra step, not only just forgiving me, but then drawing me into his family. That's a spectacular type of love. And so here's the first point, the one I really, really want us to understand because this is the key. When I was looking at, after I finished the message, I went and said, okay, now how does the world deal with rejection and hate? Typed it in. How do I deal with rejection and hate? The interesting thing that I found over and over and over again were band-aid approaches. Divert and distract. Think about this instead of thinking about the rejection. Read a good book, whatever. I don't know. They, that's essentially what the world had to say. Now, there is some value in some of that thinking. If and only if, because that's a band-aid. Hey, just get your mind off of that. The problem is the, the, the damage is still there. How do you cure the damage? This is what John is addressing right here, is in life you find your identity in God's lavish love, and not just that, his approval alone. See, when I have God's approval in my life, it's a game changer. When I find God's approval and I realize that it is as a child of God, it is a completely different relationship. Look, I could look and I could say, Bob, you know, I really like your son and he has my approval. Malachi is going to be like, so what? You know, well, he's three. Of course, he doesn't matter. But as he gets older, okay, that's kind of cool. My pastor, he approves of me. But it's different when it's your dad. Man, I approve of you. See, that's what God does. You are loved by the King of Kings, the creator of all things, and only his approval matters, and he made you just the way you are. I love going through Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, as a, a guy who used to mission, be a missions and outreach pastor because it talks about this body. We're part of the body of Christ. And he says that he gives you gifts, and he made you a specific way, essentially what he's saying. In other words, the beauty of all that is knowing that God made you exactly who you were, are. That you don't have to sit there and go, man, I'm not like Danny. I'm not like Pastor Michael. I'm not like Tim. I'm not like whatever, whoever you lift up in your life and admire. God made you the way he made you. And if he made you a liver in the body of Christ, do the best cleaning job that you can be. Don't feel like you have to be an arm and a leg and things like that. That's who he made you to be. And that's the beauty of all this. And he made you the way and only his approval matters. I tell you, a game changer for me was when I was reading Romans 14 verse 4 years ago. Because to some degree, I'm a people pleaser and I would do ministry. Yeah, to please the Lord, 100% for sure. But there was always others' perceptions of me and perceptions of work that would influence what I did and how I did it and how hard I did it. And I had this performance identity, I think, in many ways in ministry. Until I read Romans 14 verse 4, which says, Every man according to his own master rises and falls. And it so changed my life that I realized that at the end of the day, if someone wasn't happy with my work, and I could turn to the Lord and say, Father, I worked my best as unto you today. And I might not have accomplished everything that someone else might have, 
but I could fall down in peace knowing that he's like, well done. See, some parents are the kind of parents that look and say, hey, what's your report card? Unless you got A's and B's, not good enough. You're not good enough. See, he's the father that says, did you try your best, son? Yeah, I did. Come on here. Even if you got C's and things like that, he's just like, look, I love you the way you are. Every man according to his own master rises and falls. There's freedom in that statement because my identity is in him. I have to please one person alone. I rise and fall to that man, to that God. I, uh, I was thinking about this as I was preparing the message and I was paying for my, uh, I was at Panera Bread preparing the message and you put your, your, your credit card in the chip reader, right? And I always joke around with the cashiers because it says, uh, what does it say when it makes that beeping noise? approved. And I always joke around. I go, yes, I just got my validation for today. <laughs> the machine says I'm approved. And I joke about it because it's true. We're all every day looking for validation and everything. I, a, a thought came to me of an article I read about, um, that I read about Madonna. Madonna, and she was talking about every concert, every album. Here's this wealthy lady who's got everything together. She feels like she has to justify her existence. Like Rocky. I feel like a bum unless I'm winning. You find identity in God alone, not in your performance, not in other people. I read an anecdote in a book about a pastor counseling a not-so-attractive teenage girl, and he was talking to her about her identity in God, and she responded, what good is it to be loved by God when you're still unpopular? And that's the way we are. Well, okay, God loves me, but that boy doesn't. And that seems the most real, because we're led by our emotions. But I would say to her, to be loved is, more is better than to be liked. Nothing like the love of Father. Second, also in verse 1 of 1 John 3. That we should be called children of God and that is what we are. He repeats it. Sink in. You need to realize by faith that's what you are. And the reason the world does not know us that it does not know him. It's a reiteration of verse 21 of John chapter 15. They reject Jesus because they don't really know God. How does this help me deal with hate? We have to come to the realization and rejection is they're not hating you. They're hating and rejecting Jesus in you. And what this does and why this is important to realize is this should give us compassion, not self-pity. Oh, they hate me. Oh, woe is me. Oh, man, they hate me. It's going down to my court. No. What it should do is do a reset and have passion, a compassion on the person because they don't know better. This is a reset off yourself and it leads to the cure unconditional love. A man was working a crossword puzzle and asked, what is a four-letter word for a strong emotional reaction towards a difficult person? Someone standing nearby said, the answer is hate. A lady interrupted and said, no, the answer is love. You see, we're all working from the same crossword puzzle, but the way you answer is up to you. The answer to deal with all these things is love. Verse 26 of John chapter 15 says, you aren't in it alone. The Holy Spirit, the one who comes alongside to help, will help you deal with rejection that you will get and deal with it through love. That's our response to a world. I give you compassion because you don't know God. Verse 2 of John chapter, 1 John chapter 3. Dear friends, now we are children of God and what we will be has not been yet made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. This is, an, a, this is a direct continuation of my first point. Is not only you find your identity as a child of God, but you don't find it in your performance. I mean, imagine if you're the heir to the British stone. I mean, who cares what the tabloids think? I know who I am. And who you are should dictate how you act. In some ways, I think this takes faith. Uh, in some cases, you look and you say, man, you don't know the sins I've done. You don't know the sins that have been done to me. Look, those things might explain where you're at, but they're no excuse from what you do from this point on. It says that you are a child of God. It's who you are. We are now children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. <laughs> and a little bit of that takes faith. I still look and I go, oh, 
Romans chapter 7, I don't do the things that I want to do, and that what I want to do, that's the thing I, I don't do. Oh, man. And I go, really? God says I'm a child of God? Look at my life. I'm a mess. And you never get to Romans chapter 8, which says, thanks be to God, the, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so we don't live on our performance, but we live in what Jesus tells us who we are, and that's our identity. And Two last points. Verse 3. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. I think it's beautiful that Jesus says that you're pure. It takes faith. <laughs> that God who gives life to... This is what Romans says. God who gives life to the dead and he calls those things which are not as if they are. That's amazing. He looks at you and says, look, purify yourself because you're pure. In your spirit, you're holy. I get that there's this thing called flesh, but you live this way because of, here's the point, you live this way because of hope, he says, in light of eternity. The reality is none of us belong as believers to this world. We have a different passport. And I love 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It starts off, it says, this body we live in, it's a jar of clay. It's pressed down on all sides, but not crushed. Meaning there's hardships in this life. And he gets to verse 16 and 17 and he says, and he does what I call a spiritual eye checkup. And he says, but the things you go through are but light and momentary compared to the weight of glory. What he's saying is if you take the scales of life and eternity, you put the hate and the rejection, and the things that people do and say to us, and you put them on the scales compared to eternity, there is no comparison to the place that we have inherited by hope. A hope that will happen. Where no eye has seen, no ear has heard the things prepared for us. That's how amazing it is. And I believe Paul was able to go through beatings and shipwrecks and all kinds of abuse in the name of Jesus. Instead of living the comfortable life he would have had as the elite of the day. Why? Because he, had lived, he was living light in light of eternity. Soren Kierkegaard, the famous philosopher, he says, live with the end in mind. What he meant is live not thinking about tomorrow, but live in light of the end. If that's who we are, and that's what our destiny is, it should change how we live out our daily life. With the realization that Jesus also makes every wrong right. I can deal with the rejection. I can deal with the hate. Because Jesus makes it right. In fact, one chapter later, he goes on to say, Take heart, in this world you will have trouble, but I have overcome the world. He's going, look, I'm going to give you a little bit of, I'm going to sneak preview. Spoiler alert. <laughs> we win. So you might be going through a crummy time. Uh, you win. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Lastly, embrace rejection. Okay, what a crazy thing to say. Here's why you embrace rejection. Because to be hated for Christ is evidence that you are in Christ. 1 Peter 4, verse 12 through 14 says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. By the way, the church in 1 Peter was the church of the diaspora, the ones that were scattered all over the place. They lost their homes. They lost everything. Why? Because they were believers during the persecution of Nero and different emperors. And he goes on to say, But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and God rests on you. A friend of mine, Mark Cahill, is an author, but he's an evangelist. He loves, loves to share his faith. And he says, I never worry about rejection. I never worry about people hating on me. And he's had some crazy situations happen to him. And he says, there's a reason I don't have to worry about it. He says, at the end of the day, I read verses like this, and I go like this, and I make a cha-ching cashier sound. And he goes, because I just got a heavenly reward. They rejected me. All right, greater my rewards in heaven. Jesus made a promise. Cha-ching. Embrace rejection. It's evidence that you're in Christ. I'm going to finish with this. And we're finishing a little late, and that's Tim's fault. It's great. I get to talk longer, and I get a present. Four verses later in 1 John 3, God's word says, The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. The word for destroy is powerful. He's saying here that Jesus came to break or dissolve the devil's work. The word for devil is also interesting. It's diabolos in the Greek, one who shatters. Jesus came to break 
the one who shatters. That's why he came. Take heart. I've overcome the world. We win. Thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you for this message. I thank you, Lord, that in the midst of a world that loves to throw out hate, Lord, that we can react differently, that we can react in love. Lord, that we can react based on our identity in you as a child of Christ, that we can act with compassion, not sitting there and demonizing people that are of a different political bent, of a different color, but we can embrace people out of compassion and love. And so I pray, Lord, that you would take this message. Lord, that we would be transformed at our very core, that we would understand that we're children of you and that we're to live out who we are not based on performance, but because we've already been accepted. I thank you for that great promise. And I pray you'd continue to bless us as we move through the book of John. In Jesus' name.